Hey, welcome to church today. I am so happy that you're joining us. Whether you're sitting in your living room with family or friends, or maybe you're driving in the car, or better yet, maybe you're sitting on the beach or in a park because the weather is nice and warm, or maybe that's not your jam and you're under the shade. Wherever you're at, I'm just happy that you joined us today. And if you're joining us for the first time for church today, I just want you to know it's an honor to have you with us. And we don't want you to just watch the service, but as a church, we would love to connect with you. There's a few ways that we can do that around here. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a simple uh, link that you can click in the description that says connect, click that. Or if you're watching in our live stream, a button's gonna pop up right now. And then lastly, because there's lots of ways that we wanna try and connect with you. If you are watching later on, you can simply text TFHSF to 97,000 and we'll reach out to you this week. We can't wait to meet you. Well, we're gonna get ready to worship in just a few, but before we do that, this last week, uh, we had a kids meetup at the beach that was a lot of fun. I'm gonna tell you more about that in just a bit. But at the end of that event, one of our students decided to get baptized. And as a church family, we love to celebrate with everybody that takes their next steps around here. So I'm so glad we had a camera so that we could share this with you so you can celebrate as Levi got water baptized. So really quick, before we jump into worship, check this video out.
glory that he deserves. Right now, we have authority because of your authority, Jesus. Because of what you did for us. So right now, we just lift up our hands. We lift up our worship just a little bit more. And we say all the praise, all the honor, all the glory is yours. And right now, in the middle of situations, our situation might not look good, but we just remind ourselves that you are good. Come on, it might not be great, but we say you are greater. So right now, in Jesus' name, because of the authority that we have, we call heaven down over every one of those situations. We invite you into the living room. We invite you into the car. Come on, confident sons and daughters and say, God, you come and you can move and you can change things because of my words and my worship. But because you went before me, we declare that over our lives, over our families. Come on, we declare that over our city in the name of Jesus. Come on, amen. Hi. Well, hey, I mentioned earlier that we had a fun little beach meetup with all of our kids that normally would come to this building and hang out in kids ministry. And I don't know if you didn't see that invite or maybe you weren't a part of it, but you'd like to be. I want to let you know that we're going to do that again next Saturday. So on August 22nd at 11 o'clock, we're going to get together. And the simple agenda is simply to play in the sand and let kids be kids. Come on, they need to do that. So also so they can see their teachers and friends, but we also want an opportunity to get to pray for our kids. And so we wanna invite you parents out, not just your children, but we invite you too. And I know this week uh, we're about to go back to school and there's probably a whole bunch of parents like me who you are apprehensive homeschool teachers now. Like you just got told you gotta do that. So here's the deal parents, we wanna give you a break. Let our kids church people take care of your kiddos, bring a lawn chair, sit in the sand and actually we're gonna bring some coffee to you. So come join us and, and take a break on us. Uh, if you'd like to join us for that, there's a few ways that you can register to join us. If you're watching on our YouTube channel, there's a link in the description. You can click that to sign up and register. Or if you're watching on the live stream, a button will pop up to invite you to that. Or you can simply go to our website, head to the Church at Home for Kids portion of our website and you can register. And you'll wanna do that because I wanna make sure I got your coffee order right. So we will see you next weekend, hopefully. And we are trying to find all the ways to gather our people since we're not gathering on Sunday mornings. And we love to be with you and we miss you desperately. And that's why this last Tuesday, we had our first ever outdoor pursuit gathering. Come on. We had an incredible time, not just gathering for pursuit, but to be able to worship and pray over our city, to actually put feet to our prayers and walk through our city and declare uh, heaven to come down to earth and pray some big prayers over our church, over our city and beyond. So I just wanna say thank you to those of you who came out and were able, but if you weren't able to be there, we don't want you to miss out on that experience. So we've got a short little video that we wanna share with you so you can be a part of that. And uh, hopefully you can join us uh, for our next one in the future. But real quick, check this out. Awesome. 
Man, that was such a powerful time on Tuesday night. And as my wife mentioned, we will do more of those as, uh, as we cannot meet in person in this building. We'll do whatever we need to do to make sure we gather together for additional pursuit worship walks outside. And I hope you can make the next one. If you didn't make the last one, uh, because maybe, maybe you were afraid that people wouldn't be wearing masks or, you know, we'd be the reckless Christians, you know, just swinging them around in the air or something like that. Fear not, we're gonna do it safely. But it was a powerful time and I'd really love for you to be there next one. Uh, before we get into the word today, uh, I do wanna do what I do every single week. And I wanna thank you and encourage you around your giving. Um, our church is, is always blowing my mind. Every week I feel like I hear story after story after story about what people are doing to meet the needs of others in our community. And uh, this last week we received uh, kind of a, a tragic text message on Sunday from a couple in our church who lost their 30-something-year-old their son very prematurely, left a, a wife and a, and a young child behind. And it was tragic and we were praying for them and you know, obviously covering them as best as we could as a community. Uh, but uh, early in the week I got a text message from uh, the, the father, and, and he said, hey, we've started this campaign to raise money to pay for the funeral uh, of my son, and if there's anything you'd like to give, you know, feel free to do so. And it's like the second he said that, the church just stepped up to the opportunity to give. Uh, I don't know if he sent it to other people or not, but there were people from our community that began to text me literally the same day and say, hey, how do we give, how do we give, how do we give? And literally within about 24 hours, there was just a few thousand dollars that were given to this family so that they could be helped in this incredible time of need. So thank you for uh, being the church that embodies and embraces our value of living generously. Uh, if you'd like to give today, a couple of ways you can do that. You can do so on the app. Uh, you can use the button that's popping up on the live stream right now or the link below on YouTube, or you can give at the website, tfh.church. But thank you for being a faithful, giving, generous community, even in the midst of all that we're facing right now. All right, we're gonna get into the word. And as we do that today, uh, in keeping with our seriesless sermons over the last few weeks, uh, I wanna talk to you about something that's kind of been on my heart for a couple of weeks now and wasn't quite sure if uh, I would share it. In fact, before we recorded this today, uh, I asked everybody in the room to pray with me because I, I just I feel the weight of what I'm gonna share with you. And um, I think it's something that many of us have felt, but perhaps we haven't been able to articulate, but it's, it, I would consider it to be a rhema word, a now word, something that the church needs to hear in this season. Um, but before I get into it today, I, I do wanna offer a brief disclaimer. Uh, this is not going to be one of those feel-good sermons. It's not going to be one of those sermons where, you know, you're high-fiving your neighbor and you're standing to your feet and you're waving a hanky. And I wish we did more of that, by the way, at this, at this church. That would be awesome. But, you know, you're not going to, like, walk out going, I'm so encouraged and I'm filled with joy and let's go get some ice cream together and maybe some, you know, a, a burger. Like, that's probably not how we're going to feel at the conclusion of this sermon. I'm setting it up for a very depressing sermon today, right? <laughs> but here's the deal. We don't always need ice cream and we don't always need encouragement. Sometimes we need to be challenged. Sometimes we need to be called out on where we're living. I don't need to be hugged every time at the end of church. I don't need to always be encouraged. Sometimes someone just needs to come up to me and slap me and say, hey, Biddle, it's time to, to serve God and to get serious about things right now. And, and so if I could categorize the content today, I would call it just that, the call-out sermon. <laughs> It'd be the call-out material. I wanna I want call out the church for where we might be sitting, standing, living right now so that we can begin to live at a higher level, begin to live the way that God has called us to live in this season. And for the record, um, pastors don't like enjoy preaching confrontational sermons. Like I know that there's probably this thought and someone said like, oh, you just love that, right? You know, just come in, you punch people in the face with the word, you know, making everybody feel, that's not enjoyable for me. And the reason it's not enjoyable for me is A, I love people, but, but B, like I understand that there's risk and there's consequence when you begin to confront people. That's why a lot of people don't like being confrontational. They wanna save the relationship. Uh, they don't want anyone to leave. You know, they wanna they want keep their friends around them. And so people just don't say things. But that's not what Jesus was like. J Jesus talked about it and it needed to be talked about. Go, go study the ministry of Jesus a little bit and you'll find that he said some very confrontational things while he was preaching on this planet. He would say things like, hey, if you don't hate your brother, if you don't hate your mother, your father, your sister, in comparison to the way that you love me, then I'm sorry, you're not worthy to be called my disciple. What? He looked at a guy one day and he said, hey, uh, go ahead and sell all of your possessions. I know you're a pretty rich dude. Go ahead and sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and then you'll be worthy to come and follow me. He was constantly challenging what people thought was normal. He was constantly challenging what people thought was acceptable to be one of his followers. And as a result, often, some people just tapped out. They said, you know, this, this is too hard a teaching. This is too difficult. I can't, I can't follow someone like this. 
But Jesus knew those consequences existed before we ever presented that content. And so today, as, as we get into this, I, I understand the potential consequences. I know the risk, but I'm willing to embrace that, A, because I love you, but B, because I believe we're going to talk about today. I, I don't think it's my thoughts or my ideas or, you know, something that a leadership team concocted and we're like, okay, let's present this and see if people like it. I believe that this is, in fact, the word of the Holy Spirit to our church right now. And so if you don't like it or if it makes you feel uncomfortable, you can email Jesus about it. You don't need to email me. All right. You can take it up with him. But I really do believe it's going to call us out, but it's going to help some of us. And, and here's what I want to talk about. In fact, if you'd like to write this down, you can use it as a title. How to get your boldness back. How, how to get your, your boldness, your swagger, your authority. How to get your boldness back. Now, by nature of that statement, there is an assumption built in that some people have lost their boldness. That there were some people that used to walk in the authority of God, used to walk with confidence, used to walk with some boldness, but now because of what has happened over the last five or six months, they've become timid, they've become fearful, maybe they've even become quiet. Dare I even say some have become cowardly when it comes to Jesus. And that's not what God has called us to do. That is not how God has called us to live. The, the Bible says that Jesus has given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. We have not been given a spirit of fear. To be fearful or to be cowardly is an oxymoron for a believer. We've been called to walk with boldness and we've been called to walk with authority. We don't have fear, we have power, love, and we have a sound mind. But, but, but I, I don't know that that particular scripture, 2 Timothy 2.20, and that, that statement would define how most of the church is living right now. I don't know if we could look ourselves in a mirror and go, power, love, sound mind. Maybe some, but I know a lot of us feel like our boldness has been stripped away. And so we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna get real. And I believe that by the conclusion, we're gonna know how we can get some boldness back. As the bride of Christ, we need to be bold in this season. And I believe God's gonna give it to some of us today. Uh, in, in your Bible, if you have one, you could turn to the book of Proverbs chapter 28. I'm going to look at a single scripture, and then we'll talk about this Old Testament story. But uh, this will be one that you can put in your pocket and save for labor. Maybe, maybe you can write it on your mirror or memorize it or something like that. But it's a great scripture. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1 says, The ungodly run when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as Simba. No, the godly are as bold as lions. The ungodly run when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. Say that with me. But the godly are as bold as lions. That's what we've been called to be. Come on, turn to the person next to you. Tell them, buckle up, buttercup. We're going to pray and we're going to get into this, all right? Jesus, we love you. We love you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it has the power to change us. And, uh, and Lord, as I've been praying all week long, I ask that this content would be helpful and not hurtful to people. God, that this would not be the excuse for someone to get off the wagon or get off the train and say, I don't want to be part of this community anymore. I want to be part of this. I pray that it would inspire them to step up to the plate. And Lord, we ask for anyone in our community and beyond that watches this, that has been stripped of their boldness, stripped of their authority, their courage is gone. God, that even right now, today, as we go to this, this simple scripture, that boldness would return to that believer, that they would walk in the confidence and the courage and the authority that you have given them. We declare that in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen, amen. I love the way that Proverbs 28 words that. It says that the ungodly run when nobody is chasing them. Isn't that a beautiful picture? <laughs> Be honest. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever run when nobody was chasing you? I don't mean like, you know, analogously. I mean like seriously, like in real life. Have you ever run when no one was chasing you? Okay, there's a few hands being lifted in here. Uh, Maybe, maybe, let me give you a few examples and maybe you might be a little more honest about it. Um, you're going on a, on a walk late at night and as you're walking, uh, maybe you're walking down the street or you're walking around like, you know, a creek path or something like that. And you turn around and you notice that there's like somebody walking behind you and it feels like they just keep getting closer and closer and closer. And you're like, this is it. This is where I die. And so you start picking up the pace a little bit and you walk a little bit faster, but they're still kind of like right on your heels. And you just pretend in that moment that you were just out for a light jog, even though you're wearing denim, you know, you're just like, yeah, I was just jogging the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I, I've done that one before. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the honesty, Jazzy. Or how about this? Have you ever um, gotten off the freeway 
and someone seems to be taking the exact same turns as you. Every time you turn, the car behind you is going to every one of the same turns as you. And as you start to approach your house, you think, oh God, this person is following me. Like this is going to end poorly. And so you like, you turn down a couple of side streets and you take a few different alternate routes just to make sure that they're not following you. Am I the only one who lives in fear? Okay. Just, just throwing that. Okay. Oh, there, maybe this one will help some people. It's 10 o'clock at night. The trash has to go out. Yeah. You know this moment, right? You get the trash bag, you're standing at the door and you're looking out into the abyss of darkness where you know every serial killer is waiting to take you out. And you're like, okay, and you start stretching, you know, you're like, all right, here we go. And you just, <laughs> and you run back to the front door and you know, your, your parents or your, your wife is like, why are you breathing so hard? You're like, nothing, I'm fine. I didn't think anything was wrong out there. I wasn't afraid I was gonna get jumped while I took the trash out to the trash cans. Yeah, we've, I think we've all done at least one of those things before, right? Like we've, we've run when nobody was chasing us. Well, Solomon here says in Proverbs chapter 28 that that's the lifestyle of the ungodly. Not just to the trash can or not just on the walk at night, but there's this, this thing ingrained in the mind of the ungodly that thinks something or someone is always out to get them. There, there's this fear that like at any moment I could be taken out. At any moment I could lose my life. At any moment I could lose my job. And there's this, this petrified existence. It like permeates everything where they're just constantly living in fear about what could happen even if there's no chance of it happening. They're running when nobody is chasing them. But... He contrasts it with the godly and he says, that's not what it's like for those who have the spirit of God on the inside of them. For the godly, it's quite different. For the godly, we're bold. Not just bold, we're as bold as lions. As, as the king of the jungle or the wilderness or the savannah, whatever he's the king of, like we're, we're as bold as lions. We're, we're not the prey, we're actually the predators in the spirit. We're not the hunted, we're the hunters. We're going after the kingdom of darkness. We understand that we sit on the top of the food chain in the spirit and that we are actually the threat to hell, not the threatened by hell. Like we understand positionally, we can be bold as lions because we've got the spirit of God on the inside of us. And this is not some isolated idea in scripture that Solomon just kind of throws out in Proverbs 28 and I'm taking it out of context and applying it to our world. No, this is actually a replete principle in scripture. It's all throughout the word that the boldness always accompanies the righteous, that, that the righteous are bold, that the godly are bold. It exists everywhere in scripture. Let me read you a couple of samplings. Philippians 1.28, don't be intimidated in any way by your enemies. This will be a sign to them that they are going to be destroyed, but that the godly will be saved. 2 Corinthians 3.12, since this new way in Christ gives us such confidence, we now as believers, we can be very bold. Not just a little bold, but heck of bold. We can be very bold. Heck is in a different translation. Psalm 112, verse six. Surely the godly will never be shaken. They'll be remembered forever. They'll have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. And in the end, they will look and triumph um, over their foes. This is what the word of God has to say about the godly, those who are filled with the spirit of God. If you have the spirit of God on the inside of you, you have the boldness of God on the inside of you. You have the same declaration that John made in 1 John where he said, greater is the God that is in me than the God that is in this world. Nothing in this world can take me out because I understand that the God that lives on the inside of me is greater than sickness and pain and lack and pandemic and anything else that I will face. I can be bold because of that. That's what the word of God has to say. Now, conceptually, scripturally, that all makes sense. But what happens when it's not experience? When experientially, it doesn't align with the word of God? What happens when your life and your Bible don't seem to be making sense? Like I can read those scriptures, but I don't, I don't feel that way. Uh, put Psalm 112 back there on, on the screen for a moment. What happens when you have been shaken? When you do fear all the bad news that you're hearing? When you are having a hard time trusting God 
and your heart is insecure? What happens when it feels like your boldness has been stripped away because of your circumstance? How do you get that boldness back? Maybe a better way to say it is, how do you begin to stir it up on the inside again? Because if God's already in you, it's buried in there somewhere. How do we access it again? So there's this guy in the Old Testament. His name is Elijah, and he's one of the, the greatest prophets to ever walk the planet, an incredible man of God. He saw more miracles than probably any Old Testament prophet. Uh, he, and, and crazy stuff, not like, you know, he prayed for someone's hurt knee and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm all better. That's a great miracle, don't get me wrong. But like, I mean, crazy stuff. Uh, this guy, God told him to pray that it would stop raining and he prayed a single prayer and it did not rain on the earth for three years. That's crazy. And then when it stopped raining and there was famine in the land, God's like, I know you're hungry because nothing is growing. Don't worry, I'm gonna take care of you. Go sit down by the side of this brook and I'm gonna give you breakfast. Oh, how? I'm gonna actually cause the ravens to bring you bacon and eggs every single morning. Like every day he'd wake up, here you go, Elijah. Like crazy stuff. There was a, a, a widow whose son passed away and in a very awkward transaction, he somehow raised the, the son back to life. Like just, I mean, miracle after miracle after miracle, crazy, crazy stuff. But perhaps the greatest miracle of Elijah's was the showdown at the top of Mount Carmel. An amazing story. If you've not read this, go back to 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19, read the whole story. I'll give you kind of the Cliff Notes version today, but an incredible story. Here, here's how it goes down. This guy named Ahab, who was the king of Israel, a wicked dude. He's led the whole nation of Israel astray, and he's, uh, he's begun to build these, build these altars and these poles all around Israel to give glory to this false idol, this false god named Baal. Uh, I think he was introduced by his, his, uh, his wicked wife. And anyway, so the whole nation is worshiping Baal and their worship of Baal was, was very twisted. On these altars all around the land, they would sacrifice their children to worship their God and they would perform these lewd sexual acts with the temple prostitutes. And I mean, it was just this disgusting, humanistic, very barbaric religion. And it made God sick, and he longed to be with his people again. And so one day he says to Elijah, he's like, all right, it's time to call out the prophets of Baal for who they are, the false prophets. It's time to take them down. I want you to go ask the, the, the king to bring all the prophets to the top of Mount Carmel, and we're going to have an epic showdown. So Elijah's like, let's do it. So they show up to the top of Mount Carmel. There's 450 prophets of Baal and Elijah. And Elijah's like, here's, here's the rules of engagement. We're going to build an altar, and whoever's God sends fire from heaven first, that's the true God. They're like, done. So they start, he lets them go first. The prophets of Baal, all 450 of them, they begin to, to sing and to chant and, and ask Baal to send fire from heaven to ignite this altar. And all morning long, they start cutting themselves as they did in their religion and nothing's happening. About noontime, Elijah just starts making fun of them. He's like, hey, where's your God at? Where's your boy? Oh, maybe he's busy right now. Maybe he's gone away on a long trip. And I kid you not, he's like, maybe he's using the toilet right now. That's probably what he's doing, you know, because, you know, God's, you know, they got a little tummy, you know, use the toilet. Like, and this is what I love about scripture. It's like, it's theological evidence that's, that sarcasm is like godly, all right? I'm just, I love this kind of stuff in scripture. But nothing happens. And they continue. They chant and they sing and they go all day long until the evening sacrifice and nothing has happened. And fin finally, Elijah's like, all right, step aside. Let me show you how it's done. He takes his altar and he builds it up and he douses it with water three times, digs a trench around it. There's like puddles of water everywhere just to prove this isn't a magic trick and it's really God that's gonna send fire. And then he prays this very simple prayer. He's like, God, uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I just pray right now that you would send fire from heaven, prove that I'm legit and that you're the real deal. That's my translation. And in one moment, <laughs> fire from heaven comes down and it, it consumes the altar and it laps up all the water and everybody gets down on their knees and they begin to worship They're like truly your God the Lord is the one true God and Elijah says round up all the 450 prophets of Baal today's their last day on planet earth and he executes them right there on the mountain so that they can't propagate their false religion in Israel any longer An amazing epic moment a moment that would bring any person of God to this place of confidence and boldness, like, yo, I just called down fire from heaven. <laughs> like, if you were out at Ocean Beach and you guys didn't have a match and all you had was the fire pit there, and you're like, yo, I got this, fire fall. <laughs> oh, like, that's a moment. But literally within hours of this interaction, something happens to this bold 
bold as a lion, righteous prophet of God that causes this confident man to begin to turn tail and run in the other direction. Take a look at what happens in, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. It says, when Ahab got home, he told Queen Jezebel, his wife, everything that Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods, which gods? Oh, the gods that we just proved are not real. The gods we just had a little showdown with over there on, on, on Mount Carmel and they couldn't do anything. May those gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. So what happened? Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. Same dude who calls fire down from heaven, who gets fed by birds. All of a sudden, in one moment, because of an empty threat of a ratchet queen, he turns around and he begins to run. And it's not just a light jog. He doesn't go for a couple laps just to kind of burn off some steam. I mean, he went running, like he ran for a really long time. 40 days to be exact. Like not 40 miles, 40 days. And guess where he ends up? Hundreds of miles into the wilderness at Mount Sinai. And when he gets there, he finds a cave and he cloisters away in the back of this cave in fear. The same guy who was bold, who called fire down from heaven, is now sitting in a cave in fear. And look what God says to him. As, as, as God shows up to speak to Elijah in this cave, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? Translation, bruh, seriously? <laughs> hey, 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 Elijah, um, <laughs> I had you pray and it stopped raining. Uh, uh, Elijah, um, I fed you with birds. I had you go to the widow's house. She didn't have enough food. You magically made stuff appear. You raised a guy from the dead. You called fire down from heaven. I gave you the power to execute 450 prophets, the most powerful prophets in the land. What are you doing here? Where did your boldness go? And if I could be honest, I think that is a question that the Holy Spirit is posing to many in his church in this season. What are you doing here? Where's your boldness gone? You've seen my power in the past. Like, why are you living the way that you're living right now? What are you doing here? Let me make it practical and less ambiguous. COVID is real. Okay. If just to let's get rid of all the conspiracy theories and all that stuff for just a moment. COVID is real. There's a lot of people getting sick. There's far too many people that have died. It, it, it is a real thing. In fact, let me say it like this. It is a real threat. It's legitimate. Just as the threat from Jezebel to Elijah was legitimate. It's a real threat. She was the queen of Israel. So she wasn't just, you know, talking out of the side of her mouth or blowing steam. She had the capacity to have him executed. And yet, God still comes to Elijah in the face of a real threat. And he says, what are you doing here? Now, that might seem like an unfair question, right? It might seem like God should know the answer to it, right? Um, God, I'm here because she's trying to kill me. That's why I'm here right now. You heard her threats. There, there's a real threat out there. My life could be taken at any given moment. And so I, I ran and found a cave and hid away, not because I'm afraid, afraid, but because there's a real threat out there. In fact, let's not call it fear. I'm not afraid. I'm not timid. No, I, I'm just being cautious. I, I'm being cautious because 
there's a threat out there that could take me out. And so, you know, you can say what you want to say about it. But listen, this is really just caution. In fact, it's probably wisdom. I'm, I'm just being cautious. Buckle up, because here's where the sermon's about to get really offensive. Caution, yeah. But sometimes, cowardice cloaks itself as caution. That didn't feel good. I don't know how it felt in your room. It didn't feel good here either. <laughs> cowardice cloaks itself as caution sometimes. I find it interesting that cautiousness seems to be the new righteousness. <laughs> that, that caution has become next to godliness all of a sudden. If anybody does anything bold, they should be condemned. But let's praise the cautious. Now, now let me be abundantly clear, because I don't want any emails, okay? And let me be abundantly clear. There's a certain degree of caution that is reasonable, and it actually makes a whole lot of sense, okay? There is some wisdom in exercising an appropriate amount of caution, all right? Wash the hands. Wear the face covering. You know, uh, if you're sick or symptomatic and you got a temperature and don't go near me or anybody else, like no one wants you around them at that point. Just stay home and quarantine. Like that all makes sense and I get it. But there's a very fine line between caution and cowardice. There's a very fine line between what's wisdom and what's living in fear. And I'm asking you, if you were to look yourself in the mirror and have a gut honest conversation with yourself, could you be able to say that you have not crossed over that line and that you're just living cautiously or perhaps have you begun to bleed into the area of fear? When you survey the content of your conversations right now and you survey your emotional state when you lay your head on a pillow and when you survey the way you're living your life, could you look yourself in the mirror and say, I am living like the righteous. I am living like the godly. I am as bold as a lion. Or have you kind of cloistered away in a cave and gotten a little bit afraid? And listen, I'm not going to try to paint a bunch of different pictures and you know, try to give a bunch of different scenarios to explain what quantifies as cowardice versus caution, all right? Like, I'm not arrogant enough to assume that I know every single situation that is represented out there. I absolutely know that there are people that are immunocompromised and there are people who live with those that are immunocompromised and people who work in healthcare fields and th there's a whole lot of reasons to do what we're doing, okay? And I get it. I'm not gonna try to, you know, paint uh, some story about how, you know, someone is willing to go to the grocery store and be around hundreds of strangers and touch a bunch of things on the counter after they touch their masks and everybody else has touched their masks and they'll stand in line at the grocery store, but they're not willing to walk with someone who is in the body of Christ that desperately needs a friend to just walk around a lake with them or take a walk at the park with them right now because they're going through it. I'm not going to try to paint that scenario for you. And I'm not going to talk about, you know, oh, there was all these people that, you know, thousands of them, they went out and they protested and they were all clumped together and people had masks off and they were yelling and chanting and they were singing because that was the right thing to do. But, you know, then when the church wanted to try to have a hundred people gather, you know, they begin to throw stones and they begin to accuse and say that, how dare you? Because that's reckless. And you know, that's not right. It's, it's, it, this is the right message right now, but the message of the gospel that can wait, we can put that on a shelf for another six months. I'm not going to say those things because I really don't need to say those things because you know, you, you, you know, if you're in a cave if you have the Holy Spirit in the inside of you, you know if what you're doing right now and the way you're living right now is legitimate, if it's justified, or if what you're calling caution is really just cowardice and fear and an unwillingness to be bold in this season, you know. And if that describes where you're living right now, then let me, let me get a little practical, maybe a little more helpful, probably not less offensive. Um, let's talk about how to get your boldness back. Because let me remind you, you're a son and you're a daughter of the Most High God and the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you and we need your boldness in this season. We need your authority. We need your confidence. We need you to walk the way that God has called you to walk. 
So how do you get it back? Number one, if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you two very brief points as we conclude. Number one, look at the evidence. How do you get bold? You look at the evidence. I think the reason that God asked Elijah, hey, what are you doing here? The reason he was, he was calling Elijah out from the cave is because if Elijah had simply surveyed the evidence of his life, there would be no reason for him to be cowering in fear. If he had looked, and we just look at the data, all right? Nothing, nothing subjective, just objectively. If we look at what God had done in his life for the last couple of years, we look at the data, there is no reason for this dude to run away in fear. Sometimes the evidence, just the objective data is enough to stir up some boldness in you. You're like, you know what? I've been freaking out about something and I don't need to freak out about it because chances are it's gonna be all right. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of evidence today, all right? I'm gonna just throw some data out there, not, not ideologies, not conspiracies. This is fresh off the state of California's website, all right? Let me give you a little bit of data, practical. COVID's real, it's a real problem. Nearly 11,000 people have died in our state. That's absolutely tragic and we should mourn the loss and realize that there is a real problem out there, okay? But if we do a little bit of homework, we do a little bit of, of digging, a couple of math equations, which I know was a long time for some of us, a long time ago for some of us, here's what you'll find, okay? Based on the current numbers on the state's website, if, and that's a big if, if someone under the age of 50, which represents the ma vast majority of our church, if it doesn't represent you, I love you, okay? But just follow me for just a moment. If, if somebody under 50 contracted COVID, the likelihood of them losing their life is one-tenth of one percent. One in 1,000 people who contract COVID under the age of 50 dies. That, that jumps all the way up to 1.5% for the people between 50 and 65 which that represents the vast majority of our church, but under 50, one-tenth of one percent. That's a, that's a data. That's not subject. That, that is the data. So keep those numbers in mind for just a moment. If you're, if you're curious, that means you're 99.9% .9 likely to survive, okay? Here's some other stats. According to the National Injury Institute, <laughs> which is a thing, <laughs> you are 16% likely to die from a heart attack or heart disease you are 1% likely to die from a fatal car crash. Anytime you get into a car, you get behind the wheel of a car, you are 1% likely to die. You are 1% likely to die from walking. Yes, you heard that correct. <laughs> the second you walk out of your bed and you begin to walk, that, that, you have a 1% chance of death. For, for, for clarity, that is 10 times more then COVID, you have a 1% chance of dying by walking, okay? Yet, we all still walk. <laughs> we all still drive cars. We probably still eat the Cheetos and the, you know, the chocolate chip cookies when they're available to us. And we're 160 times more likely to die from heart disease. But, but th those are all far more likely than death. From COVID, this is, I'm just giving data, or I'm just throwing some data out there for some consideration. So science, yes, exactly. I believe in science. <laughs> now, those are the odds, 99.9% .9 survival rate. Let me ask you, what would you do if you knew that you had a 99.9% .9 chance of succeeding? Yeah. Yeah. What would you invest in if you knew that you had a 99.9% .9 chance of getting an incredible return? What business would you start if you knew you had a 99.9% .9 chance of succeeding and absolutely crushing it in the marketplace? To the single people, if you had a 99.9% .9 chance that you would get a yes, who would you be asking out today? Who you would you be texting right now? I mean, those are some really good odds, right? And you know what those odds do? You know what that data does? It produces some confidence. You're like, yo, if I'm going to be 99.9% .9 successful, I'm going to walk with some boldness. I'm going to walk with some authority. I'm going to walk with some confidence because chances are I'm going to absolutely succeed in this scenario. Which should make us wonder why, if we would do it for everything else, we are so timid and afraid when it comes to this. It's 
probably not from God. And again, I'm not advocating reckless living, all right? It does not say that, you know, the, 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 the reckless are as bold as lions, okay? Like, that's not what it says. I'm not saying, you know, go out there and, and don't do anything to be safe. I'm just asking, based on the data, why are we so afraid? What are we doing here right now? Let's, let's, let's roll this back a little bit and get some perspective on it. Why are we, why are we thinking and living the way that we are? And listen, I understand that um, everything that I just said for the last couple minutes has probably tweaked some people that are watching right now. I get it, right? You're like, I do not want this to be my pastor any longer. Okay, I understand. I understand that this is making some people uncomfortable, but my job is not to make you comfortable. My job is not to let you remain comfortable in the back of your, ga- of your cave. My job is to prepare you for a moment where you stand in front of Jesus and you give an account for the life that you lived on this planet, which will include the COVID season. And when Jesus asks you, how did you walk through that season? How did you handle that five, six, seven, eight months, however long it takes? Did you walk with authority and the boldness that I'd given to you? Or did you cloister away in a cave and just wait for the bad to be gone? I'm preparing you for that moment. We need a bold church in this season. We need a bold bride in this season. We don't need a runaway bride that's hiding in a cave somewhere. We need the church of Jesus Christ to walk in the authority that God has given her. And let's not forget, the day of your demise has already been accounted for. I'm sorry if that like morbid detail makes you unhappy tonight, all right? Psalm 139, your days have already been numbered in his book. Hebrews chapter 9, it says that there has been a time of death that is appointed to every single man. So you can eat all the kale and you can do all the exercise and you can live a cautious life. But at the end of the day, Jesus already knows what day you're going to go and meet him face to face. No virus gets to determine that day. Nothing that happens on this planet gets to determine that day. It has already been written in the book of your life. And if that is the case, then we should walk around just going, I'm going to make the most of every opportunity. I'm going to live with authority and courage and strength. Because it really doesn't matter. If he already knows, I I, I can walk with some boldness. I'm going to get my boldness back. So I got way off track there, but (laughs) look at the evidence. What does the data say? If you're not a data person and you're more of a feeler, let me offer you the last thought. And as I say this, the band can come. Last thought. How else can you get your boldness back? Number two, get close. Get close. If you're taking notes, write this down. Boldness requires nearness. Boldness is the byproduct of proximity to Jesus. After... God comes to Elijah and he calls him out of the cave. Uh, Elijah, uh, Elijah walks out and God begins to show him this very interesting picture, this interesting collection of, uh, of phenomenons that take place to, to prove a point. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 11, the Lord says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told Elijah. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but guess what? The Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave and him and God had a little bit of a conversation. Now, God could have chosen any way to reinstate Elijah's boldness. He could have done whatever he wanted. In fact, based on the the history of Elijah's life, it would have made sense for God to do something pretty epic, right? Like, I'm gonna use an earthquake, I'm gonna use the fire, I'm gonna use the wind. But God was not in the earth, he was not in the wind, and he was not in the fire. Again, theological proof, right there, earth, wind, and fire. He's not about them, all right? (laughs) Bad time for a joke, I get it. But what was God in? What did, he, what did he do? It says that when he began to whisper, the, the Elijah recognized, okay, God's in the whisper. Why did he choose a whisper? Proximity. But if you get close to a whisper, if you get close to the person who's speaking, 
you can begin to hear what they're saying. God wasn't willing to whisper to Elijah in a cave because the cave was a place of confusion and fear. And he said, I need you to come out of that place and get close to me again. And as you get close to me again, then I'll begin to talk to you. I'll begin to remind you that even though it looks challenging in this season, even though there's a threat against your life, I still wanna use you in this season. There's still something for you to accomplish. There's still something for you to do. So Elijah, you cannot stay in this place. I've still got some stuff for you. You're still my son. There's still a call on your life. And because of one moment, one conversation, in the nearness of God, this scared little prophet heads right back into the face of his threat and he begins to do what God had asked him to do. Why? because he got close first. I think that's the invitation today. I think that there's an invitation being made to many in our community right now. Will you come close? Will you get close to Jesus? Come out of the cave, come out of the darkness, come out of the fear, come out of the hiding. Let's have a conversation. Because guess what? If you'll get close to Jesus, he'll tell you what's cautious and what's, co what's cowardice. He'll tell you what's wisdom and he'll tell you what's fear. You don't need to rely on all of the other information sources around you to dictate how you're going to live your life. He will be very clear with you if you'll just get close to the whisper. I encourage you today, come out of the cave, take a look at the evidence. If you need the data, look at the data, it's right there. But then get close to Jesus. And I believe that if our church will do this, we will no longer be living by the mandate of fear We'll get our boldness back. We'll walk in authority again. And we'll begin to see some things shift in our city. But it's up to you. It really is. Will you make that decision? Will you look at the data? Will you get close to Jesus? And will you walk in the authority that God's given you? Let me pray for you as we conclude. Jesus, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this story that's been cataloged in history to show us you don't want us to live in a cave. You don't want us to run away and hide. But you'd like us to live in the boldness that you've given to us. I pray for every believer right now, those who have already called upon your name, who find themselves buried away in a cave in this season, would you stir something up in them? Would you begin to awaken the Spirit of God on the inside of them? Awaken the boldness that they used to walk in. I declare fear must go in the name of Jesus. Intimidation, timidity. I silence every voice that's trying to pipe fear into their spirit right now. And God, we ask that you would be loud and clear in this moment. Speak over your people. Declare you are bold as a lion. May we own that and walk in it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And for those that are watching today and you say, hey, Tim, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I've actually never drawn close to Jesus before. And if that's, if that's like what I need to develop this kind of boldness, I, I don't know how to do that. I'm gonna give you an opportunity right now to get really close to him. In fact, to surrender your life to him today. That is where this whole thing starts. If you've been hiding away in a cave and depression and sadness and anxiety and everything else that everybody's walking with right now is ruling your mind and your life. You need Jesus. It's very easy to invite him into your life. I'm gonna pray this very simple prayer. You can pray along with me. And I'm gonna help you take some next steps from there. Jesus, just declare this in your own heart after me. Jesus, today I give you my life. I thank you for giving yours for mine. I'm tired of living in this place of isolation. I'm tired of living at a distance from you. And so today I choose to follow you. Help me to be your disciple and to walk in your ways, to live as the bold, righteous, confident man or woman of God that you've called me to be. Help me to do it well until I see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we just thank God for every person praying that prayer today? I love it. If you made that decision, we are so passionate about helping you take your next steps. You can click the little button that's popping up in the live stream right now. It says, raise my hand. And if you are not on the live stream, if you're on YouTube, you can click the link below uh, that says connect there. But we really wanna connect with you and help you get started on this journey. Wanna get a Bible to you this week. Wanna tell you what the next steps look like, how to pray, how to read the Bible. But most importantly, as you saw today, your next step is water baptism. And we are, we're still doing those no matter what it takes in the middle of this COVID quarantine 
garbage. So if you, if you need to, to get baptized, again, you can do that on the app. You can do that on the website. But if you made that decision, please do not just log off without taking that next step. We want to help you out and get you started strong. For the rest of you guys, I love you so much. I hope I still get to be your pastor after this sermon. Uh, we will see you very soon. Until then, stay safe and have an amazing week.